Hey everyone, this is Josh with another Bitcoin and blockchain tutorial available at ChainTUTS.com. And I'm filming this tutorial on the 11th anniversary of the release of the Bitcoin white paper. When the Bitcoin white paper was released out into the world, it helped solve the problem of needing trust when it comes to online payments. I recommend that anybody that's interested in cryptocurrencies read this paper, but it can be a little bit terse and hard to understand if you don't already have an idea of some of the concepts that exist in Bitcoin. So this tutorial is going to be a high level overview of the different sections in the Bitcoin white paper and how to understand roughly what these algorithms and concepts are. So you can use this as a companion as you walk through the Bitcoin white paper and uh, understand what Satoshi was talking about with his revolutionary new Bitcoin system. So again, we start out the paper with an abstract in the first section, and that's talking about solving the problem of the need for trust in online payments. In our traditional payment systems, like using debit or credit cards or PayPal, there's trusted intermediaries that verify that people own a certain amount of funds and that they can in fact send them to somebody else. And they also act as the source of truth when it comes to the problem of double spending. So they make sure that if you spend your money, you can only spend it once and not try to send that same money to someone else. Well, Bitcoin seeks to solve this problem in a way that doesn't require any trusted institutions or central authorities. And the first concept that Bitcoin uses to solve this problem is the concept of public key cryptography and digital signatures. If you've ever used Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency before, you know that you have special secret keys called private keys that are used to prove that you own some amount of Bitcoin or the other cryptocurrency that you're using. So this system allows you to prove that you own some funds and create a transaction to send funds to somebody else without having to reveal any private information. So this is great for security. When you want to send Bitcoin from your address to another person's address, you sign that transaction with your private key. And that proves to everybody else on this peer-to-peer -peer network that you actually are the rightful owner of the funds uh, using this elliptic curve math, but without you actually having to reveal what your secret key is. Now this is great for sort of establishing a chain of who has owned what over time, and that's this decentralized uh, blockchain ledger that you hear about. It's sort of like a um, fancy Excel spreadsheet that shows the transfer of money between individuals over time. And these transactions are chained together using uh, these public keys and this idea of digital signatures. Now the problem is, is this doesn't solve our double spend problem that we were talking about earlier. You could essentially create a completely valid transaction with a valid digital signature twice and send the same money to two different people. So sections three, four, and 11 of the Bitcoin white paper go into solving this double spend problem. And these are the sections that introduce what's called proof of work consensus. So again, if you have tried cryptocurrencies before, or maybe you've read a little bit about them, you've probably heard of what are called miners. So what these are, are these are just nodes on this peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network. They're doing a special mathematical guessing game called mining. This is a proof of work problem. And what that means is all of these miners have to actually expend real world resources in the form of electricity and CPU power to secure the Bitcoin network. They do a bunch of guessing to try and find an answer to a problem. And the only way you can solve that problem is by expending all this computing power and guessing. But once you have an answer, anybody else on the Bitcoin network can validate that that answer is correct instantaneously. So what this creates is a system where in order for an attacker to create, say, a fake transaction on the network, they would have to outcompute the rest of the world that's running the Bitcoin software and acting honestly. So section 11, if you kind of jump forward a little bit reading this paper, 
goes into um, some actual math on uh, dealing with attacks and how attacks become so improbable. Using uh, some of these cryptographic concepts that are involved in proof of work, um, blocks of data, so blocks of process transaction, are actually linked together um, based on the previous history. And so it turns out that the further you go back in history, the harder it becomes for an attacker to try and outcompute the rest of the network and create a fake history. So if an, a, an attacker wanted to go, say, three blocks back in history and change the outcome of a transaction, not only would they have to beat everybody else on the new block that's being done um, within this 10 minute window or so, but they would also have to fake the previous 30 minutes of history as well. And that, it turns out, becomes impossibly hard um, the further you go back in history. So that's what section 11 is talking about. And I'm not super strong when it comes to math. I find that section a little bit hard to understand with all of the probabilities and summations going on. But the idea that you need to understand is, again, about this proof of work algorithm. Um, the further you go back in history, because blockchain data is linked, uh, the less you have to worry about a fraud being pulled off by an attacker. So sections five and six go into more of the distributed networking and sort of um, economic incentives around uh, using the Bitcoin software. So when transactions are created, like you want to send a payment to somebody else, this transaction is just flooded out to all the people running the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin software. Um, and anybody that wants to and has the resources to do so can do this mining problem. Uh, to try and find a solution to proof of work. But you might be asking, what's the incentive to spend a bunch of electricity and buy hardware to do Bitcoin mining? What's in it for me, other than maybe I just believe in this system? Well, Bitcoin uses a really cool system of economic incentives to encourage miners to act honestly. When a miner solves the proof of work problem, so they find a block in Bitcoin terminology, they actually get a monetary reward for doing so. They get what is called uh, the new Bitcoin, uh, the new Bitcoin that is mined. The overall concept is called the block subsidy. But they get the brand new Bitcoin that is going to be issued in this block. So over time, this decreases. Uh, it was originally 50 Bitcoin, goes down to 25, 12 and a half, and halves over time. But you get the brand new Bitcoin and you get all of the mining fees for transactions in that block. So as people create transactions, they pay a little bit of a fee to encourage the miners to include their transaction in a block. And the miner that finds this solution to proof of work for this 10 minute batch gets to keep all of that Bitcoin. So for the most part, this is a system where acting honestly and using your resources to legitimately mine Bitcoin rather than trying to fake transactions is actually more profitable. And so this incentive system keeps most of the Bitcoin network acting honestly and secure. Now, sections seven, eight, and nine of the white paper deal with uh, blockchain data. So as you can imagine, as the history of the blockchain grows, there is a lot of information that's produced that has to be sent around and stored. So for full nodes that actually store all of the blockchain history, um, the current size of the Bitcoin blockchain is huge. It's on the order of hundreds of gigabytes of information. However, Satoshi did propose um, some ways to reduce the size of this data. Section seven talks about the summarizing of transaction data in what's called Merkley trees. So there is a way to store information about transactions that keeps them cryptographically secure and verifiable without having to include every bit of transaction data. And that's done using essentially what is a cryptographic summary in the form of the Merkley tree. So uh, this special tree structure allows you to do what's called pruning and remove some data that's not relevant while still retaining the cryptographic proofs uh, of these transactions. So anyone can still validate that all this information is correct without trust, but they don't necessarily have to have 
all of the blockchain data. Section 8 describes a very critical part of you know, actually allowing this technology to be adopted by the masses, and that is what's called SPV, or Simplified Payment Verification. This section of the white paper uh, lies out a mechanism that allows light clients. So you can have Bitcoin wallets that don't have to store and validate all of the blockchain data. Again, the whole blockchain now is on the order of hundreds of gigabytes of information. And you wouldn't want to have to store all that on your phone to have a Bitcoin wallet on your phone. But thanks to SPV, there's a secure way to request data from full nodes and still validate that that data is correct without having to have the whole chain. So for the most part, this is secure and trustworthy uh, for these like clients that want to create payments. Section 9 describes some of the actual structure of the blockchain. So there's different ways to store information about the transfer of payments over time in this uh, blockchain ledger. And Bitcoin uses what's called a UTXO, or Unspent Transaction Output Model. This section describes how when users receive payment in Bitcoin, they get what are essentially digital dollar bills. They are spendable outputs. They are um, spendable denominations of Bitcoin. So it's kind of like the Bitcoin version of having a uh, $20 bill, a $10 bill, and a $5 bill, and uh, going to create a $33 payment to somebody. So uh, this mechanism allows you to consume all of those uh, spendable outputs as inputs to a new transaction, and you can send the amount of money that you need to exactly to the receiving party, and then give the change back to your own wallet. So that's a rough idea of how this UTXO model works. Now the final section we're gonna talk about, although it's a little bit out of order because of the proof of work sections, is section 10. And that's just a little primer on uh, privacy on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now remember, we have this peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network of information in Bitcoin. We have a completely public blockchain that shows the transfer um, of different amounts of currency to people over time. And so if you can see all of this information at any time in order to validate it, that also means that there could be privacy concerns with this type of system. And what Satoshi says in section 10 is he encourages uh, avoiding address reuse, for example. So he encourages that every time you receive a payment and you create new payments to other people, that you don't reuse addresses in doing so. There is more than enough uh, address key pairs out there for many, many years for everybody to use. And so he considers it best practice to create new addresses all the time. Uh, as well, I don't believe Satoshi goes specifically into this in the white paper, but there are other privacy concepts that have developed, uh, developed pretty early on in the history of Bitcoin, like the fact that public keys are actually masked when it comes to Bitcoin addresses. So your address actually goes through a couple more rounds of um, cryptography and encoding before it becomes an address. And if you avoid reusing addresses, uh, it helps you stay more secure because you don't reveal your public key until you go to actually spend. So this has been kind of a high level overview of all of the concepts presented in the Bitcoin white paper. And when I say all the concepts, this isn't an exhaustive look at the white paper. Uh, it's amazing how much valuable information and cool cryptography and distributed system stuff that Satoshi was able to put in really only eight pages of information. But again, I encourage anybody that's interested in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin to read this paper. Read it a couple times. It's okay if you don't understand everything at first. I've read the paper many times and I still don't truly understand everything that is said in there. But as you learn concepts about Bitcoin through other sources or through tutorials on my website, uh, you can go back and revisit those in the white paper. So this tutorial is kind of a nice high level walkthrough for you. I encourage you to pull up the white paper while you're listening to this or reading the accompanying uh, article on the Chain Tutorials website. 
And you know, applying some of these uh, high level descriptions that I'm giving you about these different concepts, as you actually read the you know, sort of more technical scientific parts of the white paper. So as always, I wanna thank you very much for listening uh, to this tutorial. If you like this content and you wanna support free and open content, you can support me on Patreon through cryptocurrency donations or by purchasing uh, some cool blockchain apparel on Spreadshirt.